Hello and welcome to Lego Island Decomp on the move. I'm your host, Lego Island guy. First of all, sorry for how long this part has taken. I wanted to get it out like a month ago, but as you can see, I'm in a new apartment because my last one was getting too expensive. But forget about all that because everything worked out and now we can get back to the real important stuff. Playing a 25 year old game for children. Despite me being really busy these past two months, the decomp has actually been going really well. After I made the video, I received a lot of really good contributions that I was able to approve and merge even though I wasn't able to contribute much myself. Our current reports say we already have a fair bit of LEGO 1 implemented, though don't get too excited, this number is probably overinflated. It's only tracking the sheer number of implemented functions, and we've been mostly getting through the smaller, simpler functions to start off with. Also, this percentage is based on the number of functions Ghidra automatically detected. There are likely more that we'll find manually as we continue working. If I was being more realistic, I'd say we're probably closer to 10 to 15%, but still, even that is incredible progress compared to, well, my last attempt. I think with our combined efforts, there's a good chance this could actually happen. I still don't know how long it'll take, or if we'll all get bored and give up at some point, but so far I'd say things are looking pretty good. I also got an email from one of LEGO Island's developers, who I was already in touch with for another project I have in the works. He graciously explained some of the questions I brought up in the last episode. Turns out the game's engine, known as Omni, had actually been around a lot longer than we thought. While all of the games we know about that use it came out after the release of Windows 95, it stands to reason that development started much earlier, when using Win.ini would have been much more appropriate. He believes Omni did do something with the media path variable, however they never explicitly used it for anything on LEGO Island. He also agreed that the 200 frame delay I spotted on startup was most likely a way to get around some race conditions found late in development when there would have been the biggest time crunch. That definitely makes sense. And no, before you ask, he doesn't have a full copy of the source code lying around, but he did say he'd be happy to try answering questions if we hit any big roadblocks, so big shout out to him for being willing to help out. And finally, before we get into the main topic of the video, I wanted to address some frequently asked questions. Firstly, have I looked at that source code leak from 1996? And the answer is, Yes, I've known about this for quite some time, and while it's very interesting from a historical standpoint, it's also very old and very incomplete. All of its files are dated over a year before the final release, and it's straight up missing the entire Omni folder, as in the entirety of the game engine. That's like trying to build a Unity game without having a copy of Unity, or for any non-programmer viewers, like having a roof with no house. Like I said, it's definitely interesting and even occasionally useful as a reference, but sadly it's not a shortcut for the decomp as a whole. People also asked about the Korean version. Didn't I mention the Korean localization team left some source code on the disk? Well, yes, but admittedly there was a bit of shorthand in my script there. It's not source code to the game itself, instead it's a custom language they would have given to an in-house tool called Weaver to create the game's streaming asset packs. They declare every file and all of their parameters, giving us a lot of insight into how the SI files were made, including the limited loop counts I mentioned way back in my music replacement video, but sadly without a copy of Weaver, which as far as we know has been lost to time, there's nothing we can really do with them. But that provides a great segue to the main topic of this video, the SI files. The infamous, infamous SI files. As I said, these are the game's main streaming asset pack format. Pretty much every asset used by the game is stored in these things, making them a common target for modding and, due to their proprietary design, also the biggest barrier to modding. Seriously, SI files are where modding efforts go to die. I've seen so many interesting ideas get abandoned just because figuring these things out takes so much work that most people eventually lose interest and give up. If you saw my music replacement video, you already have an idea of how tough it can be, and honestly, even I chose not to pursue SI files any further because I was going to decompile the game instead. Surely one day I get a solid three years or so to devote to just decompiling full time, right? Well by August 2022, three years had passed and the decomp was still nowhere to be seen. I felt kind of bad because if I had done more work on the SI files rather than biting off more than I could chew, maybe a lot of those modding ideas I saw come and go could have actually gotten somewhere. I decided to try making a real SI editing tool and finally figure this format out once and for all. And then it took another year before I actually finished it off, but let's not think about that. Introducing SI Edit, a tool I mostly developed a year ago, but never announced because I got stuck on reconstructing some of the larger files. 
I felt like I didn't want to advertise something that only mostly worked, so it sat around until I had more time to investigate what was wrong. Then it sat around even longer because I started working on other projects instead, but long story short, last month I finally solved all of the issues, at least as far as I know. I'll be using it extensively to talk about what I know about the SI files, so I thought I'd mention it right off the bat. Now like I said, we've covered SI files before in my music replacement video, but because we're going into even more detail here, and in case you haven't seen that one, I'm going to be starting over more or less from the beginning. We don't know exactly what SI stands for, but it's safe to assume it's something about streaming and interleaving. Early prototypes of LEGO Island simply call them interleaf files. As it turns out, they were a key part of the aforementioned Omni Engine, which appears to have begun primarily as a framework for streaming data off CDs. Back then, it was a real struggle just to get stuff off the disc in a timely manner. When Omni started in the early 90s, the majority of CD drives were still 1x speed, only 150 kilobytes per second. And you couldn't just install your assets to the hard drive because the average hard drive back then was either smaller than or only slightly bigger than a CD. And that 150 kilobytes per second is only the maximum when reading sequentially. If it has to jump around to read files in multiple places, you're wasting a lot of precious read time. This is where interleaving came in. It allowed games to read multiple files at a time while still reading the disk sequentially as much as possible. SI files can be found in a number of Mindscape games of the era, such as the Windows version of Warhammer Shadow of the Horned Rat and Chessmaster 5000, which it turns out is the origin of the Mindscape logo jingle. God, that's cursed. But just because they all use SI files doesn't mean they can be transplanted from one game to another. Firstly, there are different versions of SI files. For example, Warhammer identifies its version as 1.0 and only really uses them for occasional cutscenes. LEGO Island's version is 2.2 and it uses them constantly throughout the whole game. If you try to exchange them, the game either locks up or throws an error like this. Secondly, SI files can't really be used without the game explicitly driving them. There's some confusion over exactly what the SI files do, especially since in LEGO Island they're in a folder called Scripts, and there's clearly a separate file for each room of the game. It's tempting to assume that Omni, and by extension LEGO One, is just a base game engine, and that all of the game logic is inside the SI files and interpreted at runtime. Something along the lines of the Sierra Creative Interpreter. This could make for a very versatile system during development, allowing game content to be added or modified without having to recompile the game itself. So is that what they did? Well, the answer is sort of, but not really. The vast majority of the game logic appears to be hard-coded, as in it was written in C++ and is baked into LEGO 1. However, the SI files do have a remarkable amount of control, whether the developers used it or not. For instance, every object's position and rotation is in here, allowing you to move and turn anything from the buildings around the island, to the NPCs and their animations, to the 2D pre-rendered sprites and backgrounds. Shh, <laughs> damn right, the Brickster's got nothing on you, you can really f*** this town up. Additionally, objects can provide an optional string that controls further attributes, the most interesting being the action attribute that actually can command the game to do something. For example, by default, clicking the Infomaniac sends a notify signal that results in him playing his next animation. However, if I rewrite this line, I can get it to do other things like play the no CD animation. Oops, you have to put the CD in your computer. You can also get it to load a new SI without unloading the previous one. This is pretty trippy because you can basically merge two rooms together. You can drive the ambulance. Of course, why didn't I think of that before? Well, of course it wasn't. Unfortunately, SI's declaring actions only happens about three or four times throughout the entire game. Everything else appears to be hard-coded into the compiled LEGO 1 DLL. Though, the SI's do control which C++ class that room gets attached to. I can make the score cube room think it's the police station by attaching it to the police class. Then, since the C++ code controls the actions from there, clicking arrows will suddenly navigate to other rooms in the police station. It's unclear why they opted to hard code most of the time, though I can guess that maybe it was just faster to do things that way. Unless you design a whole custom programming language into the SIs, you'll obviously be able to achieve more in actual code. Though it would be interesting to explore trying to add new content to the game solely through editing SIs. I wonder how far we could get. So that gives you a pretty good rundown of what they are, but how exactly do they work, and why are they so hard to reconstruct? Well, looking back, they're actually fairly straightforward once you know how they work. It's just that being an all-binary format with little to no documentation means it's not immediately intuitive what everything does and why, but when you figure those things out, it makes sense more often than it doesn't. It just takes a long time to get there. To start with, SIs are based on the extremely simple Resource Interchange File Format, or RIF. 
Riff was developed by Microsoft and IBM as the basis of various multimedia formats like WAVE and AVI that shipped with Windows 3.1. But when I say developed, I really mean stole and slightly tweaked from the IF specification developed by Electronic Arts for the Amiga. As was standard for the time, Apple had already made their own derivative of the IF format for audio, which meant Microsoft had to do it too. The Amiga and Macintosh at the time had Big Endian Motorola 68K CPUs, and the primary innovation of Microsoft's RIF was to store numbers in Little Endian for Intel's x86 CPU. Otherwise, outside of a few minor tweaks, they're basically all about the same. IF, and by extension RIF, defines an extremely simple way to organize multiple different types of data in one file. For example, a WAV file needs its audio data, but it also needs a header describing how that audio is formatted. And it may optionally contain some metadata as well. RIF provides a straightforward way to organize all that stuff, and Windows includes some APIs specifically to read and write them. For Mindscape, they were probably a no-brainer, especially since they were introduced with Windows 3.1 around the same time Omni started. It would have been fairly modern technology to adopt at the time. SI files have a header, a table of contents, and then a big list of what are called streams, which consist of one or more objects whose data is split into chunks and then interleaved with each other. From there, it's not too hard to just replicate each of the data sections as is, though it can be a little frustrating if you're not using Windows's RIF APIs, which I wasn't because I was trying to write something cross-platform. If your implementation is off in any way, the game will simply crash with no explanation, and it'll be up to you to comb through every byte you wrote to figure out that one little thing you got wrong. Once you've figured out all that, you then have to write a chunking and interleaving system. Audio is chunked by the second, and video is chunked by the frame, which means you'd better learn how to work with raw audio as well as how each of the game's video formats work. But the toughest part by far is the buffering system. Once again, you'll probably remember this from my music replacement video. When the game streams data off the disc, it actually only reads a certain amount of data at a time. The amount it reads is called the buffer size, and is actually dictated by the SI file itself, listed in its header section. What makes this complicated is the fact that it expects all of the chunks to be wholly contained inside that buffer. If a chunk spills over, the game will simply barrel along reading it until it eventually tries to access unallocated memory, causing the game to crash. As such, it is the SI files' responsibility to make sure any given buffer is entirely self-contained. Mindscape came up with two ways to make that happen. It is possible to declare a chunk as split, so you separate the data across two or more chunks, but inform the game that they all belong to the same frame, or whatever it is. The system is robust enough to allow a single chunk to split an infinite amount of times, which is sometimes necessary when inserting much higher quality audio. The second solution is much simpler. You can insert a padding chunk until the end of the buffer that the game will know to skip over. Not the most efficient use of your CD read time, but may at times be the least problematic solution. All of this has to be handled by your SI reader, and especially by an SI writer. If you're replacing assets with files of a different size, which is almost always going to be the case, the chunks will shift around, meaning all the padding and splits will now be in the wrong places. To make these new files work, you need to redo that all from scratch, and that was one of the biggest issues I had trying to write this stuff. While the SI format is completely custom, a lot of the assets contained are very standard, though almost all of them are obsolete and end up causing issues for us today in one way or another. All of the 2D images are bitmaps, which isn't terrible. Programs like Photoshop and obviously MS Paint can still work with these fine. However, the game doesn't seem to support bitmaps any higher quality than 256 colors. You can choose your own palette, but still, that's only 256 colors. Not only does that complicate inserting bitmaps in general, but it's especially unfortunate if we want to insert any HD remakes or upscales of anything. The game did support running in 16-bit, or 65,000 colors, but the bitmaps don't get any better in that mode, it just upconverts the same 256 color bitmaps from before. When I try to insert something like a 24-bit bitmap, the game straight up crashes. I'm guessing it was just never written to work with anything else. In fact, due to the way Windows's 256 color palettes work, 20 of them end up getting reserved by the system, and then LEGO Island reserves an additional two, so it's actually more like 234 colors. If you're not careful with your paletting, you may end up with something like this, where 22 of your colors are all messed up. I'm hoping SI Edit will handle this automatically someday, but for now I have to use Photoshop to make the palette work manually. Smackers are used for the game's FMVs, and while these were extremely common back then, they're a little difficult to make nowadays, and not particularly efficient compression-wise. You have to use a really old version of the Smacker tools that makes specifically version 2 Smackers. Later ones only make version 4s that aren't compatible with LEGO Island. This tool works, but it's not the most intuitive thing in the world. That being said, Smackers can actually be remarkably high quality thanks to their lossless encoding mode. Just don't expect to fit these on a CD-ROM anytime soon. 
But with this, I was able to import higher quality renderings of the opening logos just for a taste of what an HD remaster might look like. Sadly, I don't think we have any better versions of any of the other FMVs, at least not yet. Another video format the game uses is Flick. This was another one that was fairly common in video games throughout the 90s, but has very much fallen into obscurity today. Imagine if GIF had never been adopted and popularized by the internet. That's pretty much Flick. And in LEGO Island, it's used in very GIF-like situations. Any minor 2D animation like the book, these boxes, those screens and the build sections, and even the facial animations. Ironically, for a while, we thought the facial animations were in a custom proprietary format because Lyrip, for years the best SI extractor, struggled to extract them at all. I think the developer didn't know they were a standard format and was trying to reverse engineer them from scratch, leading to this creepypasta sh** being the best we had for a while. But nope, they're just flicks. There are some open source libraries for making them which I'll probably incorporate into SI Edit at some point, but for now you have to figure out how to make them yourself. Finally, all of the audio is in WAVE, which is also not necessarily a problem. WAVE is still regularly used today, especially in audio production, but as a distribution format, it's woefully inefficient on storage space. That might not matter so much today with our terabytes of hard drive storage, but back then it forced the developers to downsample the music and dialogue to fit everything onto a single CD, noticeably reducing the quality of all audio in the game. While we're lucky enough to have higher quality recordings of a lot of the music from second generation tapes, most of the master tapes are gone for good and higher quality versions of the dialogue are yet to surface. So you might be wondering why they used WAVE instead of something like MP2 or MP3, which did exist at the time and could have fit much more quality into the same space. Well, most likely it came down to two things. MPEG audio had to be licensed and that license almost certainly wasn't cheap. But the main reason was probably because decoding a complex audio codec required more CPU cycles than they realistically had. Keep in mind, the game was released before 3D accelerated graphics cards were widespread, so it had to be possible to render the whole island on the CPU alone. And to be honest, on the PCs of the era, it was kind of struggling on that front already, so it's not surprising they didn't want to burden it any further. But it is a shame that for many of these sounds, this is the highest quality copy that still exists. Now, most of these aren't showstoppers, but they are, well... Roadblock. Part of me would love to rip out whatever decoding code is in the game and replace it with something like FFmpeg, which can decode just about anything. But I already know that would be a huge undertaking, even if the decomp was done, let alone right now. But enough about the standard formats. What about the stuff in here that's totally custom? To be honest, a lot of the stuff we've only just started scratching the surface. Before now, it was just a lot harder to look at it in any more detail. One of the few things the SI files don't contain is 3D model data. Instead, they're installed to disk in a file called world.wdb. Presumably that stuff was considered both small and critical enough to take up some space on the hard drive. But what that means is the SI files must request what models they need at what time. You can see the buildings on the island simply have an instruction telling the game to make a model at the location specified. And the 3D animation files only get more interesting from there. They're a custom proprietary format that, as you might expect, contain keyframe data, but they're also able to pull in objects from world.wdb as they see fit. For instance, I can transplant this animation from the information center into the hospital, and there's enough metadata in there to make it work almost completely. You can also edit the animation files to bring in a different character for the same animation, which is how I got this monstrosity. And I hereby pardon myself of all crimes, innocent as a newly opened box of bricks. There's also path information which seems to control what parts of the map you're able to walk on. A friend managed to extend the path boundary out to here by messing around with it. Once again, we've only just barely scratched the surface here, but this could be very interesting to play around with. I've always wanted to be able to touch grass. So that sums up what I've found so far about the SI files, and with SI Edit, I think we finally have a tool that can mod all of the SI files with no trouble. There are still things I'd like to add to it to make it as usable as possible, and there may still be some edge case bugs I haven't found myself yet, but I was able to do everything I showcased in this video with it, and I only really scratched the surface. Consider it still in beta, and keep in mind I'll be mainly focusing on the decomp from here onwards, but I'll try to keep adding improvements and working out more of these custom formats when I can. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this update and deep dive into the SI files, but before you go, I really have to give a big shout out to my patrons for making this all possible. Seriously, the support I've gotten for this project has been incredible and really helped me during what ended up being a fairly challenging move. I really appreciate you guys, and if you aren't a patron yet, consider becoming one. I post work in progress updates and discoveries on there that don't always make it into the finished videos. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye guys.